G'day and welcome to video lecture three. Uh, today we're going to do a case study on Al-Qaeda. And only recently, as I'm sure you recognise, Osama bin Laden was killed. For many in the West, this was good news. As President Obama said, justice has been done. But for many in the Arab world, it was bad news. They viewed him as a holy warrior and they will now probably treat him as a martyr. Osama was the leader of Al-Qaeda for over two decades. He was an inspirational and charismatic leader. However, because he was on the run since escaping the Tora Bora Mountains of southern Afghanistan in December 2001, he had a minimal role to play in the planning and direction of Al-Qaeda terrorist attacks. Now, this judgment is being considered at the moment by the CIA as they look through the intelligence material that they got from his hideout there in Abbottabad in Pakistan. But certainly my view is that his ability to direct the daily operations was very limited because of the limited access he had to the internet and to the telephone. Now, I think we should view Osama bin Laden as something of a franchise owner and he spawned a chain of global terrorist operators. These independent operators, you might think of them as the franchise owners, worked within the Al-Qaeda brand but responded to local conditions and grievances. Rather than the mastermind, he was the inspiration for the terror attacks that we've seen. I don't think that his death will have much impact on the campaign of Al-Qaeda. Their ideology will remain, and there are others such as Ayman al-Zawahiri who can readily take his place. Indeed, Zawahiri has been the ideological leader of Al-Qaeda, and he's perhaps more extreme than bin Laden ever was, and he's certainly got plenty of operational experience. Bin Laden's death won't do much to change the medium-term threat from terrorism. The global franchise owners will continue with their mission of hatred. And this trend is already very clear with increases in terrorist activities such as Somalia, Yemen, North Africa, South Asia and even now on the increase in Europe. In the long term, without the resolution of the grievance ex expressed by people like bin Laden, we should not expect any real change in the overall threat from terrorism. Sun Tzu, he tells us, know ourselves, know our enemy. I know I keep harking on about this, but it's really important. If we do know ourselves and we know our enemy, we're going to be more successful. Right now, we don't seem to know much about Al-Qaeda and even less about their motives. In my view, this is our fault. We haven't been listening. We are not even close right now to understanding the nature of the war on terror. We've declared war on terror, which is really a tactic, and we've misdirected our best strategy. The threat from Al-Qaeda has materialised quickly and somewhat unpredictably. We've neglected the real issue by not listening to what Al-Qaeda has to say and what they're trying to achieve. We're struggling to find a way to react. Our intelligence was not geared to this type of threat, nor do we have the most appropriate doctrine, training, cultural approach and equipment to prosecute what some are calling this war on terror. In this lesson, I want to consider some of these issues and see if we can't find more about Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda and the motives of the people that he leads. Al-Qaeda has been called the most dangerous terrorist network in history and the United States see it as their top terrorist threat. Many other countries have the same view and there is an enormous international effort to hunt down the leader of Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden. He's perhaps the most wanted man in history. Al-Qaeda seeks to rid Muslim countries of what it sees as the profane influence of the West and replace their governments with fundamentalist Islamic regimes. Al-Qaeda means a base or foundation. There are many theories about when the word was first used. I prefer the view that Abdullah Azam, the chief ideologue of the non-Afghan militants fighting the Soviets, named the organisation at the first signs of the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan around about 1988. He took the view that many of the army of Arab volunteers assembled to fight the Soviets should not be disbanded but focused on a new mission. 
This new mission was to be the reconquest of the Muslim world. He argued that a standing vanguard of fighters was needed to serve as the leaders of the Ummah, or the Islamic community. The term Al-Qaeda, used in an article published in 1988, was in fact Al-Qaeda al subah and it means the solid base. Al-Qaeda was to be a revolutionary vanguard of the strong that would radicalise and mobilise the Islamic world. Azam was killed by a car bomb in Peshawar in 1989. Osama bin Laden inherited the leadership of Al-Qaeda on his death. Bin Laden had already been active in the group in Peshawar where the express aim was to create an international army which would defend Muslims from oppression. There were many other groups who had left Afghanistan and they were also beginning to coalesce around the aim of returning to their countries to campaign against their own governments. Osama bin Laden and his band of about a dozen men who had been radicalised and emboldened by their experience in Afghanistan had a broader aim in mind. They had an international view and an ambition to resist Western dominance in Muslim countries such as Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Bin Laden returned to Saudi Arabia in 1989 and in 1991 he left for Sudan where he spent six years. In 1995, Bin Laden's operatives detonated a car bomb that killed five American servicemen stationed in Saudi Arabia. In 1996, a larger car bomb killed 19 American servicemen at a housing complex in Saudi Arabia, and he was also implicated in many other attacks. By this time, the United States had focused on Bin Laden as the primary terrorist threat to America. Intense diplomatic pressure forced Sudan to expel bin Laden in 1996 and close down his terrorist training camps. He went back to Afghanistan where he joined forces with the fanatical Taliban known as the Students of Religion and they had a militia running. They were in the process of taking over the country from a more moderate Islamic government. The group grew to around 100 and began to mature over the next five years. They were deeply involved in the training camps which attracted hundreds of Arab volunteers. It's important to remember that in the early stages, his was only one of a large number of similar groups. It was largely unstructured, but began to take shape around three elements. First, the hardcore group, and these were some of the finest militants from around the world. Second, a network of co-opted groups. Now, this was not an overly formal association, but bin Laden became to be seen as a heroic figure who symbolised the collective struggle and the many of the militants who came to Afghanistan from 1996 to 2000 for military and training were attracted to him. A powerful narrative and for many a compelling ideology. Bin Laden was opposed to the presence of Christian troops on Saudi soil. He was offended by the humiliation caused by Western troops in the land of the holy places, Mecca and Medina. The United States were the enemy because they supported the Saudi government who was seen to be corrupt and apostate. As early as 1989, he had issued a fatwa from Afghanistan giving a final warning for the American forces to leave Saudi Arabia. In February 1998, bin Laden issued a second fatwa. It's worth examining this fatwa in some detail because it includes comments such as the one you can read here. As his organisation grew, bin Laden made no attempt to impose his authority but earned respect rather than organisational power due to his experience, charisma, ties with radical groups, his considerable personal wealth, performance as a strategist, lack of personal ambition and a reluctance to claim responsibility for any attacks. He was seen as a messenger rather than a guide. Well, we all know what happened on September the 11th in 2001, and I'm not going to go over that ground again. Nor, as you have noticed, do I intend to recite chapter and verse the terrorist events of the time. They are many and varied, and you can look them up yourself. What I want to do is concentrate on the theological underpinnings of Al-Qaeda. Let's start with a few facts. Islam literally means submission to God. The word Muslim means an adherent of Islam. The Quran is the religious text of Islam and it is believed to be the verbatim word of Allah. 
Muslims believe the purpose of life is to worship God. They regard their religion as the completed version of other faiths revealed to prophets such as Abraham, Moses and Jesus. Islamic or Sharia law is comprehensive, touching on almost every aspect of life and society. Islam is the second largest religion in the world and is growing rapidly. And the majority of Muslims belong to one of two denominations, the Sunni and the Shia. It's estimated that about 13% of Muslims live in Indonesia, the largest Muslim country, 25% in South Asia, 20% in the Middle East, 2% in Central Asia, 4% in the remaining Southeast Asian countries and 15% in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sizeable communities are also found in China and Russia and parts of the Caribbean. In the United States, there are about 7 million Muslims. With about 1.57 billion Muslims comprising about 23% of the world's population, it's a very sizeable community. They live in a belt around the centre of the globe and there are 56 states where Muslims are in the majority. Vincent Olivetti, in his book, Terror's Source, comments favourably on the spiritual vigour of Islam. But at the same time, he draws the conclusion that Islam lacks real power. And to give evidence for this conclusion, he states that technologically, there have been no substantial technological or scientific breakthroughs from Muslim countries in the 20th century. He tells us that politically, 75% of the world's refugees are Muslim. Economically, except for small oil-rich countries, they are the poorest countries in the world. And militarily, they have tended to perform badly. Bin Laden's death will have an impact on Al-Qaeda but it will not be a mortal blow. There are other members of the group who are in a position to take over from him. Al-Qaeda is not essential for the conduct of terror around the globe. Many are motivated by deep-seated hatred of the West and are inspired by Bin Laden and his followers. Even with Bin Laden dead, it's no time to relax. The war on terror goes on. Well, for now, that's enough on Al-Qaeda. Please have a close look at the readings and be prepared to discuss the tutorial questions when we next meet at Bruce for the face-to-face -face lecture. That lecture will cover the topics of networks and structures and terrorism in Australia and Southeast Asia. I think you'll find the readings from Mark Sageman particularly interesting and there's also a very challenging reading from Mueller and Stewart. They suggest that the threat from terrorism is actually quite low and could be deemed as acceptable. They refer to an astronomer who has calculated the risk of being killed in a terrorist attack as being similar to being killed by a comet or asteroid strike on Earth. Of course, there are some tutorial questions and there are four. Uh, you can read them on this slide. And I'll be interested in discussing with you what impact the internet has had on the nature and structure of terrorist networks. I want to talk about can Al-Qaeda survive without a leader? And we'll discuss Sageman where he talks about leaderless jihad and suggests that we should show restraint in trying to eradicate the jihad movement because they might just expire on their own. And I want to know if you agree. And of course we'll discuss that issue as terrorism an existential threat to the modern state. Well, see you at Bruce for the face-to-face -face lecture. Bye for now.